On this episode of From the Vault, we hear from Bayard Rustin, perhaps one of the most understated leaders of the civil rights movement. He helped with the formation of the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, in 1942, which was conceived as a pacifist organization, based on the writings of Henry David Thoreau and modeled after Gandhi's nonviolent resistance against British rule in India. Bayard Rustin would devote his life to the nonviolent pursuit of equal rights for all. Mr. Rustin and Malcolm X debated on the direction of the freedom movement at an event called Separation or Integration at the Community Church in New York City on January 23, 1962. Prior to the debate, both Malcolm X and Bayard Rustin joined the Pacifica Radio WBAI host John Donald in studio to discuss the direction of the civil rights movement. Here in the WBAI studios are Bayard Rustin, Executive Secretary of the War Resisters League, and Malcolm X, Minister of Mohammed's Temple of Islam in New York. Both of you gentlemen are working in your own ways for the welfare of the American Negro. And the first thing I'd like to ask you is if you would describe the purposes of your individual organizations and tell us something about the philosophies inherent in them. Mr. X. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Uh, Donald. And I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here today to uh, represent the Honorable Elijah Muhammad uh, to your audience. And as you know, Mr. Muhammad is the spiritual head of the fastest growing uh, group of Muslims in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, he perhaps is probably the greatest drawing card uh, among the so-called Negro masses, more so than any other so-called Negro leader today and proof of which a year ago in uh, Washington, D.C., he uh, appeared at the Uline Arena and drew 10,000, and in New York at the St. Nicholas Arena, last year he drew 10,000, and this year he, I think he drew another between 10 and 15,000. In Chicago, he drew uh, 15,000, and I cite these things just to show you that uh, as a man, no matter what people, uh, whether they agree with him or disagree with him, they have to admit that the masses of the so-called Negroes are interested in hearing what he has to say. Uh, probably in the past two years, he has become the America's most talked about and most written about black man. And even at the present time, I'd say he's one of the most uh, contra he's the most controversial topic, topic um, namely because he's having such miraculous success in getting his program over among the so-called Negro masses. And if you say if you ask me what it is, I can best tell you what it is by what he is uh, credited with uh, doing. The uh, Time magazine last year, uh, in an article about Mr. Muhammad, pointed out that he has uh, successfully eliminated from among his followers the use of alcohol, which is one of the things that has destroyed our people here in America as a race. He has successfully uh, eliminated uh, dope addiction. Uh, uh, profanity, excessive profanity, which actually stems from disrespect of uh, self. He has uh, successfully eliminated uh, stealing and crime among his followers. He has, uh, Time Magazine also pointed out that he has, uh, Mr. Muhammad has uh, been successful in eliminating adultery and fornication and prostitution and making the black man respect his woman, something that has been characteristically absent among uh, our men. Uh, and Time Magazine also pointed out that among the Muslims who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, juvenile delinquency has been eliminated. And uh, in the U.S. News and World Report, uh, about a couple months later in 59, they pointed out that Mr. Muhammad was uh, uh, successful in making the so-called Negro see the importance of uh, an economic program that would... Uh, in fact, when you think of what Time Magazine said, they were giving him credit for being probably one of the greatest moral reformers that has appeared among the so-called Negroes here in America yet. And when you uh, tie in what the U.S. News and World Report magazine said concerning his success at getting uh, the so-called Negroes to set up stores and uh, factories and uh, farms, farms to feed ourselves, grow food for ourselves, factories to manufacture things for ourselves, and uh, places of business to create jobs for ourselves, 
the, uh, the point behind this particular phase of Mr. Muhammad's program is to make the so-called Negro economically independent, to keep him from having to embarrass the white man by demanding that the white man give uh, him a job when he can actually, Mr. Muhammad feels that our people can get together and pool our, our resources and our talents and whatnot and um, make jobs for ourselves. And lastly, I'd like to say that uh, what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is teaching is not uh, what we have been accused of, uh, nationalism. Uh, nationalism, the difference between being a Muslim and na a nationalist, nationalism is the, is the political approach or a political solution to the problems that confront the so-called Negroes in America. The, black, the aim of the black nationalist is the same uh, as the aim of the Muslim. Uh, the Muslim and the black nationalists have no differences in objective. We are pointing toward the same goal. But the difference is in method, or, uh, or yes, method. The black nationalist, wherein he relies on a political solution to the problems that confront the so-called Negro, we as Muslims believe that the only solution to our problem is a religious approach. And this, this is why we stress the importance of a moral reformation. As a rule, the black nationalist will not talk to you about God or any religion or any kind of a, a moral uplifting of the moral values. Whereas the Muslim, he stresses at first to uh, raise the moral standard of the so-called Negro, and by doing this automatically, it gives, it lends, it tends to give him more dignity and self-respect. And it uh, elevates his thinking to the point where he begins to think in terms of doing something for himself rather than to sit around and uh, beg somebody else to share with him what they have amassed for themselves. So I would like to stress that uh, Mr. Muhammad is not a politician. He doesn't believe that politics is the solution to the so-called Negro's problem. He, he says that the primary ingredient involved in, in our solution, uh, it will take God, God himself, uh, uh, has to have a hand in it, especially because the the uh, problem of the so-called Negro is so unique. His problem is different. The, the problem of the so-called Negro in America is different, perhaps, than the problem of any black people anywhere on this earth since the beginning of time. And so our entire approach is a religious approach. We believe that uh, everything that every condition that the Negro is in today was preordained, predestined, and prophesied. And we believe that we're living in the fulfillment of that prophecy today. We believe that our being here in America is in terms of biblical prophecy. We believe that the uh, slave master's oppression of us is in line with biblical uh, prophecy. And we believe that all of the trouble that the slave master is having on this earth today, all over the world, is all in line with, with uh, fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And we also believe that Mr. Muhammad's presence in America in the midst of the so-called Negroes and his reason for teaching what he's teaching exactly as he's teaching it is all in line with the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. So the one thing that I would like to stress is our program is strictly a religious program. <coughs> our uh, solution is a religious solution. It's not a political one. But Mr. X, does this involve the creation of a black state in America? Uh, yes, it, it, while I uh, answer you like this, it involves the creation of a black state for the black man, if not in America, somewhere on this earth. If not somewhere abroad, then right here in America. But primarily it involves the acquisition of some land that the black man can call his own here or somewhere else. If, uh, if the powers that be don't want it here, then they should make it possible for it to be somewhere else. If they don't want it to be somewhere else, they should make it possible for it to be right here. It does have some political characteristics, then. Uh, any religion, if politics, if by politics you mean the freedom and the rights of the black man, any religion that doesn't take into consideration that particular ingredient that involves the freedom of the black man is the wrong religion. But uh, politics as such is not the solution. But the, the, the divine solution would have to have that particular ingredient in it. You can call it politics if you want, but uh, uh, I wouldn't call bread uh, salt. It has salt in it. Salt is one of the ingredients. Yeast is one of the ingredients. 
Flour is one of the ingredients, and the overall problem of the so-called Negro in America is not a political problem as such. It's an economic problem, it's a social problem, it's a mental problem, it's a moral problem, and it's a, it's a spiritual problem. So we need a solution that uh, doesn't deal with politics alone. What, why, what good does it do a man to be politically uh, free and at the same time be, be economically dependent upon the man who gave him the so-called political independence Why he's still a slave. So uh, we feel that since all of these ingredients are involved, only God himself can uh, give a solution that will solve the whole thing. And this is the solution that we feel the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is teaching among the so-called Negroes here in America. Mr. Rustin, we hear from you. I am very happy to be here and uh, particularly anxious that uh, Malcolm X and I should clarify some of these questions which he has brought up in my mind. I would like to state very simply what it is that I believe and feel. Uh, I believe that the great majority of the Negro people, the black people in this country, are not seeking anything from anyone. They are seeking to become full-fledged citizens. Their ancestors have toiled in this country and contributed greatly to it. The United States belongs to no particular people because of race, color, or creed. People have come from many parts of the world to construct it. And it is my view that the great majority of Negroes take as their key word and the great number of Negro leaders the term integrate, which means that rightly or wrongly, they choose to become an integral part of the United States. I believe that we should work politically to the degree that that is possible but I also believe that, and through the courts, but I believe that at the moment we have reached that point where the justice and freedom for the Negro people will come about largely because they, with a sense of dignity and pride, organize themselves to demand to become an integral part of all the institutions. And thus, such things as the Montgomery protest, the student sit-in movement, and the effort which some of us are now making uh, in regard to elections, where we do not honestly feel that either of the major political parties uh, can solve the problem as they are now constructed. We are doing those things by direct action, which we feel will splinter the existing political parties cause a political realignment in which the freedom and justice for all people, including Negroes, can be uh, achieved. Now, uh, this is not a unique position, uh, and certainly while a controversial one, not so controversial as that which uh, Malcolm X puts before us. And I should like, therefore, to ask him this question. It would seem to me that the logic of your position, really, is to say to Negroes, or black people in this country, uh, we ought to migrate and uh, set up somewhere in Africa a state uh, in which men are free to follow uh, a particular religious ideal because it seems to me, ultimately, this is where you have to come out. I, 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 I don't see how this escapes as being the logic of your position. You say that perhaps uh, a state will be set up here, and, but on the other hand, your attitude is if you're not wanted, then you don't want to be where you're not wanted. So why isn't the logic of your position to go to the heart of the matter and take the Garvey position and urge Negroes to return to Africa? Well, uh, Mr. Rustin, number one, when you speak of us uh, uh, striving here to become full-fledged citizens, or as they say, first-class citizens, uh, number one, 
uh, most of the Negro leaders, the so-called Negro leaders, uh, they have gotten the, the Negro masses to think in terms of second-class citizenship, which there is no such thing. Uh, we who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad look upon a man as either a citizen or he's not a citizen. Uh, he's not a citizen by degrees. He's a citizen or he's not a citizen. And, and as long as the black man in America is not recognized as a first-class citizen, we don't feel that we are citizens at all. No other people in America are placed in a second-class citizenship category. People can come here from Hungary, which is a communist country, and be incorporated or integrated into the American way of life overnight. They don't have to come in as third class, second class, or any some, some other kind of class uh, citizen. The only man that's placed in this category is this so-called Negro who has sat around uh, and begged the white man to accept him uh, uh, as an integ integral part of his particular political setup and whatnot. Now, um, we feel that if after a hundred years since Lincoln issued the so-called Emancipation Proclamation, if the black man here is still not recognized as a first-class citizen, which means free, then uh, we don't feel that uh, what Lincoln did actually set the so-called Negro free in the first place. Uh, not freedom in its uh, full sense of the word. An example. If uh, you have a unique problem in that if the black man in Nigeria, for instance, uh, strives against his oppressor to gain his freedom, once he gains that freedom, the oppressor leaves. But the black man in Nigeria is already at home. He has his own country. If uh, the black man in uh, India uh, is striving against his oppressor for freedom, once his oppressor, the colonizer, uh, gives him that freedom, the colonizer leaves, the oppressor leaves, but the slave or the ex-slave is already at home. This is the... Now, now, this is all well and good, but you are not answering my question. I'm, I'm answering your question. Right, go ahead. Uh, if the black man in Kenya, the same way, if, he's, if he uh, re rebels against the British, his British oppressor, and gains his freedom, then the oppressor leaves. Now, the black man in America's position is unique in that uh, he begs for freedom or demands for freedom, but once he gets this so-called freedom, he's still 9,000 miles away from that which he can call home. So he has a, a problem that's uh, different than the problems of the other dark people all over this earth who have been striving for freedom. And uh, the, uh, uh, where over there, they can use the passive approach, which is uh, sit down or sit in or rebel in that way, uh, when you have in India, like Gandhi, where they had three or four hundred million black people striving against a couple hundred thousand white oppressors, then passive uh, passiveness worked because all they had to do is stop, sit down. It's like an elephant sitting on a mouse or something. But here they are the majority and the oppressor is the minority. Here in America, you got black, the black man is the minority. And when you call, a, call yourself sitting down on the white man, all he has to do is let you sit. He can get someone else to run his factory or whatever else he wants to do. But to sit there and use this so-called passive approach, we don't think it will work because we don't find any uh, parallel. We don't find, for instance, anyone being encouraged to uh, seek freedom in a passive way other than the so-called Negro here in America. Many of the whites who pose as liberals and act as advisors for Negroes tell them that uh, be passive, be peaceful, turn the other cheek. But these same whites who uh, encourage the so-called Negro to use the passive approach uh, have never advocated a passive approach to uh, throw off the yoke of bondage to any white uh, groups of people who are in bondage. When they speak of the uh, uh, whites in Eastern Europe who are under the yoke, the Russian yoke, they don't tell them to be passive in their resistance. They feed them ammunition. They feed them guns. They, they uh, uh, make heroes out of the freedom fighters from Hungary. They make them great heroes. But uh, when it comes to a black man, be he in Asia or Africa or uh, in America, if he becomes militant in his resistance against oppression, then immediately he's classified as a fanatic. But if it's a white man or a white group or someone in a white country that's trying to throw off uh, bondage, the, the propagandists uh, 
label that one as a hero and they label the dark people who are trying to resist this uh, oppression be it no matter what kind of resistance is it is they re they label them as fanatics as racists as extremists or as rebels so what it does it makes the black man in America who would like to fight for his freedom or take a, a militant, uncompromising stand, it makes him reluctant or afraid to take that stand for fear that he'll uh, place himself in this particular category. And I would like to say this, and also in answer to your question, that it is not the uh, uh, so-called uh, this kind of movement and that kind of movement in America that's causing the white man to give an inch, and that's all he's giving is an inch. Uh, it's 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 the pressure that the white man is under today from the outside world. He is not uh, telling you and me that we might be integrated into his particular educational system or economic system 10 years from now. He's not promising it this year, you know, 10 years from now or 20 years from now or even 50 years from now because he loves us. But he'll tell you every day. You listen to some of these political speeches. They're 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 they're. they're uh, uh, catering somewhat to you and me uh, only because they are in a position where they are forced to try and impress and gain the friendship or the sympathy of the African nations that are getting their independence. The white man today is posing as the leader of the so-called free world. And the only way he can be accepted as the leader of the so-called free world is to be accepted by the majority of the peoples on this earth, the majority of whom are, are non-white people. And they measure him by how he treats the non-white people here in America. And to impress them, he stands up and talks this old in integration talk, which is hypocrisy. Not because he's going to integrate you and me, because we'll still be begging a hundred years from now, but to impress our brothers in Africa and Asia, and I don't think that he's going to be successful at it. Now, am I to take it that what you are saying is that you are really opposed to integration because you don't think it's meaningful and cannot work? We Therefore, I come back to my question. Now, you said a great deal about nonviolence, which we should get into, and you've implied a certain number of economic things, but I have to get first your basic position clear in my mind, otherwise I don't think the rest of the discussion can be meaningful. You have to answer for me clearly the question as to whether what you ultimately have to see as a logical position is leaving the United States. If for the next 200 years Negroes are not going to be citizens by your definition, why isn't it logical then for Mr. Uh, for your leader to say, let us find a piece of territory somewhere and go to it. Because uh, either you are advocating the continuation of slavery, if that isn't logical, because you say you can't get it by the methods which I am advocating, which is the slow grinding process of integration. Now, I want to know where you stand on that, because I can't see other things clearly unless I see this. Uh, now, in, we, uh, I, I'll try and make it as clear as I can. If by integration, it, we believe that in, uh, integration is hypocrisy. If you were going to use the word brotherhood, uh, that's another thing. We don't believe in integration, but we do believe in brotherhood. Integration... But it, do you believe brotherhood is possible here? Uh, if any time, sir, you have to pass a law that will make the white man accept you into his society that's not brotherhood that's hypocrisy if a man holds a gun on you to make you put your arm around me and pretend that you love me that's not brotherhood that's hypocrisy right. and if america then if the if the uh, uh, if this country has to pass laws to make the white people accept us into their educational system and has to pass laws to make the white people accept us into their in, in, into better housing in their neighborhoods, then what that is, that's, uh, that's uh, the government is holding a gun on the white man and making him pretend that he wants you and me to sit beside him. That is hypocrisy. The government is forcing the white man in America to become a race of hypocrites. Now, if uh, the white man, with no laws passed whatsoever, would accept the black man into his school, would accept the black man into his neighborhood, 
would accept the black man into his social system, economic system, and political system without laws having to be passed, then we would go for that. We would say that that's brotherhood, that's voluntarily, and it will work. Gonna happen? Why, your common sense tells you, sir, that it's not going to happen. Then, if you cannot do this through the constitutional methods of going into courts, of having laws, which I call integration, and if you cannot do it by the spirit which you call brotherhood, then what do you see as the future for black people here, and why should they stay? Uh, sir, the future for the black man in America, as we've been taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, since uh, you can see, and any intelligent person can see, that the white man is just not going to uh, share his wealth with his ex-slave, or share his house with his ex-slave, or share his fields with his ex-slave, uh, if the slave keeps pressing him, sooner or later there has to be a, a showdown. If the white man, the slave master, does not want the ex-slave in his house, then he has to uh, let that slave go for himself and find a house for himself. Now, Mr. Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, our leader and teacher, teaches us this that God has taught him that the only solution for the slave and the slave master is separation. Ah, so then you do believe in separation. We absolutely believe in separation. Right. We now, believe that separation is divine. Right. Now, if, the, if there is to be divine separation, are you people being logical? Are you saying then we ought to take over, let us say, an area of the United States which is predominantly Negro and send more and more in until we control it? Or are you being logical by saying, let's get outside of here? Uh, I think both is logical. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it's logical when you find that you can't get along with a man in peace to uh, set up house somewhere else. Now, when we say that, when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that uh, God has declared that the black man in America must have some land of his own. That means he must have some land of his own. Uh, the land doesn't have to be uh, in Asia. The land doesn't have to be in Africa. The land doesn't have to be in Canada. The land can be anywhere. And uh, if, the, if right here in America, since, as you say, we've been such good workers and faithful citizens, I'd rather say faithful servants, right. uh, it's, uh, we haven't received any payment for our labor, it would only be just if the uh, master, if his intention is good, since he knows he's not going to bring about this integration, the best thing for him to do is uh, let us have some of these states. And we can go into these states, instead of uh, begging him to live next door to him, we can go into these states and set up farms and feed our own people, set up factories and manufacture clothing and uh, other utilities for our own people, set up businesses where we can make jobs for our own people. And this will keep us from having to beg him for that which he has set up for his people. Right. In other words, then, uh, Daily News is right in describing your movement as being an apartheid movement. They compared you to South Africa, where they say uh, the whites should be in one place and Negroes in another. It seems to me that what you're saying is pretty much the same thing. No, sir. We don't feel that the Daily News is qualified to classify us as anything or compare us with any South African uh, philosophy because, number one, the uh, people in, the, in South Africa are some people who left Europe and went into Africa, a continent that is not theirs, and took it over from the black people to whom it belonged, and they are now there advocating white supremacy, which is a false doctrine. They're advocating black inferiority, which is another false doctrine, and uh, they're basing their entire governmental system on the continued existence of a, of a, of a, of a country uh, of a of uh, they're staying on a continent that they don't belong in, and also uh, ruling over some people that they have no authority over. Uh, we who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad are advocating peaceful existence here in this country, which we feel is is just as much ours as the white man. It's not his because he took it from the Indians, and he can't uh, object to us because he brought us here. We didn't come here on our own. 
We didn't come here voluntarily. He put us in chains and brought us here and then worked us for nothing for 310 years without paying us one day's uh, labor. Now, I would like to point this out, Mr. Rustin. If you have a hundred people who work for you for nothing for a week, you must, you have, you make a profit. If you have a million people who work for you for nothing for a year, you become wealthy. Well, then when you have millions of black people whom you can work for nothing for 310 years, you can easily see why America became the wealthiest and the most powerful country on earth faster than any country in history. But here you have 20 million black people today whose parents were worked for 310 years for nothing. What do they have coming for them? Not only did their parents work 310 years for nothing like an animal, but their parents also were the most faithful soldiers that the master had. What payment have they gotten? And uh, today, they, they're not asking for much. They're not asking uh, for what someone else would ask. Instead of asking for something that's real, they're asking their master to let them occupy one of the rooms in his house or one of the rooms with him in his house. Now, this is still not asking for something. If America gave the black man here half of this country, they wouldn't be giving us anything. They, they worked our mothers and fathers for 310 years with no pay. The Senate, the, the, the Congress, and the U.S. Supreme Court found it necessary to appropriate funds to, to, to repay billions of dollars to the Indians for land that was taken from the Indians three or four hundred years ago. And if this generation of whites will recognize a debt uh, incurred by the former generations of whites to the former generations of Indians, uh, then this same generation of whites also uh, must recognize debts incurred by the former generations of white to you and my uh, uh, forefathers. And if, they, if, they, if, if their own courts uh, uh, decree that they should pay the Indian today for what was done to the former generations of Indians, don't you think that God is more just than the court system of America? And if the court system of America says that the Indians must be paid, what do you think God would say that, the, that America must do in payment to 20 million black people who worked here for nothing for 310 years? All right, I take it then that what you're really saying is that you believe that a certain section of the United States should actually be given over and because Negroes have worked for it and deserve it and that that should be their territory that this is your solution to the problem only solution is separation separation not right. integration now now that we've got that clear it seems to me we can go back and build on that to, for me to raise some other questions with you now what how do you see the Negro now, and I'm all in favor, you see, of doing away with dope and alcohol and profanity and the like. This is all to the good. But uh, whether you like it or not, the, this is no answer to the ultimate problem which you face. Now, given the fact that Moses kept the children of Israel in the desert for 40 years in order to do away with their slave mentality and to build up a new leadership, he also had to know precisely where he was going to take them. He had to have a piece of land. Now, you want a piece of land here. Doesn't this, isn't there some inconsistency with your economic policy, then, in this regard? Because it seems to me what you are saying is Negroes should own their own stores. Negroes should become independent uh, uh, economically. Now, is this possible, where you have Negroes spread over the country the way they are, uh, you, you want them to buy land in Philadelphia and New York and, and, and Texas and uh, what good is this? What are they going to do? Then give it up and move somewhere else? And what is the psychological implications of this? Uh, well, first, sir, uh, when you mentioned Moses, you mentioned the best example that you probably could have. You pointed out uh, the people that Moses was leading mm -hmm. were uh, probably the closest parallel to the problem confronting the so-called Negro in America than any in the Bible. Uh, Moses' people were strangers in a land that wasn't theirs. Mm. The black man in America is a stranger in a land that's not his. Mm. Moses' people had a, a slave mentality. Mm -hmm. And when they were found, they were worshiping gods other than their own. They were worshiping in a religion other than their own. 
The Negro in America is the same way. He worships the white man's God and he's following in the white man's religion. He, the Negro in America is in the same fix socially, uh, mentally, uh, ec politically, economically, and spiritually as the people whom Moses grew up amongst in uh, so-called in Egypt uh, uh, 4,000 4, years ago. Now then, if you recall, Moses didn't advocate integration. Moses advocated separation. At nowhere, nowhere in that Bible can you show me where, Mo where, where Moses went to his people and said, believe in the same God that your slave, slave master believes in, or seek to integrate yourself with Pharaoh. Moses' one doctrine was separation. He told Pharaoh, God told me to tell you, let my people go. By go, that meant separate. That did not mean to seek integration in the slave in the house of bondage. It did not mean to seek the the uh, acceptance of the slave master. It did not see, mean to seek the friendship even of the slave master. It meant that just what Moses said, let my people go. And then he told his people, if you follow me, I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey. I believe that it is very important to have a great sense of racial identity because I believe that it is quite impossible for people to struggle creatively if they do not truly believe in themselves. Uh, I believe that dignity is first. Now this for me is doubly important precisely because believing in integration and, and not having been told where we are to go, I can see nothing more logical than staying here and struggling for one's rights. Also, because of moral principles which I hold, but leave them aside for the moment, I can see no way for the Negro to struggle except through nonviolence and a dedication to strategic nonviolence as, in sense, a matter of principle. Now, therefore, if you are going to be able to struggle with nonviolence, to a certain extent, you have to have affection for the people who are mistreating you. No affection for the other fellow is possible without a great sense of dignity in oneself. And therefore, the dignity of the Negro, for me, is not something that is an aside. It is an essential of the struggle. The people in Montgomery were able to struggle and get integration on their buses for a simple reason. Ten years before, they could not have done it because they did not believe in themselves. When they believed in themselves, they could then be socially affectionate to the opposition while at the same time being extremely militant and walking and being prepared to sacrifice. I think this is most important. And I would therefore agree with Malcolm X that doing away with the ugliness which our people have had as a result of their poverty and their position is very necessary and important. We can certainly agree here. Thank you. Uh, and you know, I was so happy, Mr. Uh, Rustin, to hear you say that uh, dignity is most important. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad absolutely, uh, in, he emphasizes to us the importance of dignity, but you cannot uh, have dignity. Uh, uh, dignity means a high regard for yourself. Right. You can't have high regard for that which you have no knowledge of. And when you ask a, a, a white man his nationality, for instance, and he says German, immediately he's connected with a with a German nation, a German flag in the past, a German culture. If he says uh, he's a, a, uh, an Englishman, he's connected with England and he's connected with a culture. Now, if you ask a black man in America and he says Negro, right there, he's putting a term on himself that carries more contempt with it than any word that exists in the, in the Webster's Dictionary today.